Hi, everybody. Judy, the YouTube lawyer here today with a celebratory live stream. Thank you guys for being here or for watching on replay. So it's a very exciting day because um, this time of May means a lot in terms of anniversaries. Uh, most importantly, it's the 15th anniversary of my solo law practice, which I started back well, obviously 15 years ago in 2006. Um, originally my office was in North Raleigh and then I switched it over to Morrisville and now it's currently in Cary, North Carolina. So um, for those of you who haven't watched a lot of my other videos, I graduated from Georgetown Law School. I worked in Northern Virginia for a small firm for a little while before moving to North Carolina, which um, coincidentally was also almost exactly 20 years ago. So a lot of stuff tends to happen in May. So um, thank you so much, Alec Jones, for your um, words of congratulations. So um, the first thing I'd like to start out with is to give some value to the viewers out there who might be interested in how to start your own business or more specifically, how to start your own solo law practice. So I did write down a bunch of um, tidbits of advice. Um, they're kind of disjointed because there's just like so many tips or so many mistakes that I made that I'd like to tell people about. But if you have any specific questions or comments or things you want me to focus more on, feel free to leave a comment and I'll try to address them. So um, when I first started my own practice, I had already been out of law school for about six years and I had worked for other small law firms. So that was really to my advantage. I mean, of course, it, it was no fun working, <laughs> you know, most of the time the pay in small law firms is nothing close to what you make if you worked in a large corporate law firm. You know, when people go to law school, a lot of times they're totally bedazzled or dazzled by this dream of working for a humongous law firm, maybe in New York City or Los Angeles or DC, where the starting salary could be about $190,000 or $200,000 plus bonuses. And then, you know, you supposedly you work your way up and keep making more and more money. And then a very smidgen, small smidgen of those people might make partner. But um, that never happened to me. So <laughs> I'd like that to be a cautionary tale that it, it only works out like that for a very, very small percentage of all law school graduates. Um, so when I worked for those firms, even though the pay wasn't great, the positive thing was that I gained a lot of very practical hands-on experience because I had client contact from day one. So, oh, thank you. Thanks, Kayak. I really appreciate all your support, especially since you were one of my first supporters when we met on one of those small YouTubers, Facebook groups. Thanks for being here. So, um, yeah, so I started my own firm basically because I didn't really see a future at my previous law firm. Um, there were some financial problems going on. And, um, you know, I'm not sure if my former employer caught wind of what I've been saying on my YouTube channel, but um, I, I do want to really thank her for being a good mentor and also taking me on. You know, I know it's really tough having associate attorneys and having that extra burden of also having to pay more employees and everything, much less train them. So I did learn a lot about how to practice employment law from, um, from that previous employer and learned a lot about litigation from the other employers too. So, um, oops, I'm sorry, I just kicked the table. <laughs> so um, started my own law firm with um, a nice, nice chunk of money saved up. So that's one tip is that you really shouldn't start your own business until you have enough money saved up. It's very, very risky to just graduate from law school or to have no money saved up. I'm talking about less than $10 thousand dollars or less than twenty thousand dollars saved up because most businesses do not even make money the first year that they are in operation um, a lot of attorneys i've talked to said that they didn't even make any money or make any profit until after a couple of years of having their own solo law practice so i'm not sure what it's like in other industries but definitely the more money you have saved up before you jump ship from your employer 
the better off you'll be and the likelihood of success is going to be greater. And it's also because by then you will also have more experience. So um, that's where, again, I come back to the point that even though I didn't work for any prestigious huge law firms and I didn't make the big bucks at large corporate law firms, at least I did have a lot of client contact and I pretty much knew what I was doing from the time that I opened up my law practice. And if you guys saw the live stream from last weekend with my attorney friend, Becky Moriello, who has her own immigration law practice here in North Carolina, um, she said that um, one attorney who was sort of maybe like a mentor to her said that if you start your own law practice straight out of law school, you are going to commit malpractice. So I pretty much agree with that also. And hey, Dr. Sav, thank you so much. Dr. Sav, I'm so glad to also have met you, you know, early on through one of those, um, those Facebook groups, maybe it was Annie's fam or something. And, um, you know, to have been able to collaborate on our channels, it's really nice to have made so many nice YouTuber friends over the last year. Thanks for being here. So um, so with that said, you know, you definitely want to have as much money saved up as possible. And here's the thing, like the job market is pretty lousy for most students who don't graduate from the very, very top law schools, where if you're not at the very top of your class at say like an average ranked law school. So there are a significant number of law school graduates who just think that they're going to become solo practitioners just out of necessity because they couldn't find a job. So that's where I really caution against that. Again, um, I think it's, it's still much better to just have some sort of job, even if it's document review or doing some contract work for other attorneys so that you can still have some modicum of income coming in. Otherwise, you could just wind up being broke, you know, taking out loans, taking money from your family. I don't know how people are funding it. But um, it is very scary to just come straight out of law school and then try to start your own law practice. So I really don't recommend that. Oh, thank you for being here. Um, so um, the other thing that um, I would like to mention, um, one key to my success being a solo practitioner was to always keep my overhead as low as possible. So this is where people are like, oh, but I really need to have this, or I got to have this, or, you know, I need to have expensive looking furniture. I have to have a great looking car. I have to have, you know, a fancy looking conference room with a law library or my own office and everything. So it's, um, you know, it, different markets are totally different. I mean, there are some markets, I guess, where there are some solo attorneys who have told me that, oh, you know, you don't even really need to have an office. I just meet my clients at the courthouse in a meeting room, or I meet my clients at the jail, or, you know, if you're doing court appointed criminal defense work, yeah, then maybe you don't really need to have a fancy office with a conference room and a beautiful waiting room and a receptionist to greet people, you know, for, for that guy that I was talking to, he was in a different county, not in the county that I mainly practice in, where more of the people are kind of lower income. So um, I got the feeling that he was doing not only family law, but also a lot of court appointed, you know, DWI criminal defense work. So in those cases, you know, yeah, if you have to meet your clients in jail, then what's the point of spending, you know, 500 to $2,000 a month renting nice looking office space if you don't need to impress them? Yeah. Oh, okay. Hi. Hi, Serena. I've watched why Asian Americans shouldn't go to law school. I'm still debating if I should go if T14 becomes fruition two years from now. What's your recommendation to me? Well, I think it's, it's really hard to just tell a person without knowing their full story or anything, you know, like what are your other options? If you don't go to law school, then what would you do? Would you be going to, you know, like a top ranked business school? If that's one of your choices, then I would say go to business school. If you get into say like MIT or Northwestern, Harvard, you know, um, yeah. And also if whether you need to take loans to pay for the full cost of law school, or if your family is able to afford to send you there, um, you know, those are all the things. Because the problem is, is that let's say you still get into like a top 10 or top 14, you know, since I went to Georgetown. But if you wind up in the middle to bottom half of the class, which of course half the people are going to, then your options aren't going to be that rosy. And it might turn out to just be 
you know, kind of like a bad decision if your other option would have been to say, go to dental school, you know, go to medical school, go to business school, or, um, you know, work in the IT field, some other type of field that can also get you a high earning job. So, um, so it's really hard to just tell somebody, well, should you go even if you get into a tier 14? Because um, I do have another video, there's a live stream as well as a shorter version of it that I turned into a video. It's a quiz called, should I go to law school or should you go to law school? So um, that might be something fun for you to take to see how well you score. Um, so I can't predict because, you know, when I went to Georgetown, I have to admit I was sort of arrogant when I was in law school because I kind of assumed that, you know, based on the US News and World Report rankings and the statistics that I was going to come out making at least 90,000 a year, you know, no problem, get a job at a big law firm or some sort of well-respected place. And I was going to be set in my career. But um, on the other hand, you know, my situation might not be I mean, it, it was definitely unusual because I had to move to North Carolina away from DC due to my ex-husband's job. So I think that really did not help my career because moving here, I had no connections at all. And I had only had one year of experience working in Northern Virginia. So, you know, there, there was a bigger law firm around here that gave me an interview, but then they ultimately rejected me. And the partner said that they were really looking for someone that had more experience. So, um, so definitely my career was kind of thwarted by that. Whereas I, I'm pretty sure if I had stayed in DC, you know, I could have stayed working for my previous firm or most likely I would have had more lateral opportunities in the whole greater DC area where, you know, I, I think like having a Georgetown law degree has more uh, cachet around there compared to being in North Carolina. So um, it's really, really hard to generalize. I mean, once in a while, you do find people who went to bottom tier law schools who wind up working for the bigger or mid range law firms or regional law firms or, you know, become judges or, you know, some sort of prestigious off council job. But um, I think the chances are greater, the more higher ranked your law school is though. Yeah. So um, let's see. Oh, thank you, Francis. Thank you for being here. Francis, I, I believe you're also an attorney, but in Canada. Yeah, it is. It is definitely a lot easier because um, one of my relatives is in the, um, in the medical profession. And she was telling me years ago how expensive it was to start her own practice. There were there were tons and tons of like expensive equipment that she and her business partner had to purchase. They had to take out loans. You know, there were special companies to give the doctors loans to buy these equipments. And, you know, it was just like a lot of overhead. And they also had to have the staff. They also had to knew how to they also had to know how to build the insurance companies. And um, it just seemed like that, along with the malpractice insurance costs, were just astronomical compared to the cost of how much it takes to start up your own solo law practice. So really, in actuality, you know, I shouldn't be complaining because when I started my solo law practice, even though I had a lot of, or in my mind, it was a lot of money saved up. I also had a working spouse who provided health insurance. So I wasn't really that worried about making a certain amount of money every month. And I didn't have any law school debt. So I was very lucky and very privileged to be able to start out that way in addition to having had six years of experience working for other firms. So, um, so yeah, I mean, things worked out pretty well for me. Um, it, it definitely was not easy at all, though. The first year, I just kept thinking, you know, what am I doing? Maybe I should try to get a part time job doing something, maybe even working at Starbucks or Target. Or, um, you know, I wound, wound up tutoring the LSAT for Kaplan on weekends because I really had so few clients. I didn't take many clients from my old firm. And so it was kind of a bummer. I remember also I interviewed for a job to be a career counselor at UNC Law School because my practice was going so poorly. I, I mean, I was barely making any money. I was just sitting around. Most of the time I'd be in my living room, sitting around waiting for the phone to ring and just kind of wondering like, how the heck did my legal career come to this? And what am I doing with myself? There was no need to go to the office because I didn't even have any clients to meet. So sometimes I would just hang out at the courthouse and listen to court hearings, which was also a good way to learn. Or I would go to the North Carolina Bar Association Bar Center, which is 
in Cary, not too far from my current office. And I would just sit there in the library reading through previous um, old continuing legal ed binders to learn about how to do family law and everything. So that's kind of how I filled my days. It was just kind of depressing at times. And I was like, God, you know, why did I go to law school? This is just really crappy. Oh, and so I interviewed for that job with the career services office at UNC. And I remembered a woman in charge just, you know, didn't seem very optimistic. And she was like, well, what are you going to do when your practice starts revving up and you start generating, you know, start getting more clients? And in the back of my head, I was like, yeah, well, that's not happening. That's why I'm interviewing for this job. Please give me the job. But of course, she rejected me. But um, lo and behold, within, I would say within six months to a year, that's really when my practice really started taking off. And a lot of it had to do with um, just some luck and a lot of networking with other attorneys who were finally, you know, they knew that I was in business and they were willing to refer people to me. So um, that's been a great thing, just building a sense of community amongst other attorneys in my area and the surrounding counties and um, kind of having an informal referral network around here. Yeah, thank you, Jared, for being here. I was just watching your channel again today. It was kind of slow with work today. And uh, Dr. Sa yeah, sometimes rejections are a blessing. Yeah, you're right, because it is true. Like if I had gotten that job to be the career counselor at UNC Law School, then I probably would have just focused on that and made the kind of like so-so, you know, not so great salary and just kind of given up on my solo law practice. But since she rejected me, then it was like, okay, well, I guess I'll just keep teaching the LSAT for Kaplan and then I'll just keep muddling through. But the real thing that was the blessing. So this is why I really, uh, my other piece of advice is you got to network and you should be networking as an attorney if you're an attorney, you know, with people that are other attorneys. And it might seem kind of counterintuitive or weird because it's like, well, why would they refer cases to you? Wouldn't they want to keep all the cases to themselves? But um, the legal profession is actually very specialized. So there are certain people that will not touch family law, divorce, or child custody cases with a 10 foot pole. And of course, you know, I'm not going to do criminal defense. I can't just run in and defend somebody. I have no experience doing that. I also have no experience doing bankruptcy law or immigration law or tax law. So there are certain areas of law that other people just don't know anything about. And that's when you want to be their go to person where they're going to immediately think of you and recommend potential clients to you if anyone contacts their firm or you know say one of their friends of a fr friend of a friend needs a referral or something so um, that's basically what I did because even before I started my own practice I was already always very active in all these different bar associations and voluntary bar groups I was on the board of the Durham Orange County Women Attorneys Group when I was working out in Durham, I was active in the North Carolina Advocates for Justice. They had a young lawyers division and they also had like different divisions for like employment law and family law and stuff. So um, yeah, I was active on the lift serves and then um, a group of younger attorneys and I, we even had our own informal networking group. We called it our fun attorneys dinner. So we used to get together probably about once a month. And it was usually at a restaurant, either around Durham or Raleigh, we kind of switch it up. And it was just like a group of people, like cool people who are just pretty laid back. And we just wanted to shoot the breeze about our jobs and stuff and just kind of had fun. So um, I do miss those get togethers. But um, a lot of people either moved away or, you know, got married and had kids and stuff. So nobody had any time to like, get together at night anymore. So um, so lo and behold, I went to a Durham Orange County Women Attorneys. Um, it was either a dinner or some sort of like networking event after lunch, after after work out in Durham. And this was probably maybe after I had started my own practice for at least three to six months and hardly had any clients. So I was talking to this other attorney who had been on the board with me, Janet Knight Ledbetter, who um, sadly died of cancer a number of years ago. But Janet... Um, told me, oh, you know, I can't believe like an attorney like you who's like so experienced, you know, is having difficulty getting clients. And I was like, yeah, well, you know, it's just sad. But most of the good clients, they all want to go with the bigger firms and the places to advertise. Because this was back when I was also still trying to do personal injury and workers compensation and SSDI cases, which is what um, I also did at my previous firm.
So Janet told me about the Hyatt legal plan, which is now known as the MetLife legal plan. And she told me that she had gotten lots of clients through them. And her office was in Hillsboro, which is in Orange County. So, you know, it's not like we would have been like competing for the same clients or any, anything since I was all the way out in Raleigh. So as soon as um, Janet told me about that later on that evening or the next day, I went on the website and looked up the legal plan and filled out an application. And um, after a little while, I found out I was approved to be part of their attorney panel. And that has generated a huge amount of business for me. I mean, it's to the point where I just quickly stopped advertising because I was already getting a lot of phone calls and a lot of good clients through the legal plan. Even if they had problems that weren't covered by the plan, I could tell them my regular rate and tell them this is how much a retainer deposit is going to be. And um, that's how I've gotten a lot of clients. Um, I would say that's probably a accounted for maybe about a quarter of my revenue, but the rest has all been just like really good referrals from other attorneys that don't do the same type of law that I do or not in the same county. Um, some people find me through the internet. So you definitely want to have a website. Um, last week, Becky Moriello said that she doesn't even have a website. So I find that pretty incredible in this day and age for an attorney not to have a website, but it sounds like her clientele is totally different because she markets herself towards the Spanish speaking immigrant community. So a lot of that is more like word of mouth. And then, you know, she has her own uh, talk show on Sunday in Spanish. So it really depends on your niche and what the market is like in your city to figure out, you know, do I really need a website? Do I really need a fancy looking office? You know, what practice areas should I focus on? You know, you just have to get to know other people. And that's where, once again, you got to network with other attorneys. So, um, oh, what does your ex-husband teach at law school? He teaches patent law and antitrust and intellectual property. I think he was also um, assigned a contracts first year class to teach last year. So, um, so yeah, he doesn't teach any of the same subjects or the areas of law that I practice in. Yeah, how do you allocate so much time? Can you give an insight into your day? Oh, well, every day is totally different. And this is what I love about being a solo practitioner and having my own business is that I can pretty much make my own schedule as long as I'm there when the clients need me. Or, you know, obviously, if, if I have to go to court, I have to go to court. But so much of my day is very flexible. So um, you can see some of my um, day, days and nights in the life of a lawyer vlogs, I have, I've probably made at least like five to 10 of them so far. And I think I'll continue doing that because every time I do those kinds of videos, I get a lot more subscribers from those specific types of videos. So most of the time, um, pre COVID. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, sometimes I do feel like I'm a lot more productive when I actually go into my office to get work done. So if COVID weren't around, then definitely I would still be going into the office as much as possible. Um, but I do like working on the weekends as well as at night because I feel like I can focus more. Whereas during the day, I'm constantly being bombarded by emails and phone calls from people. So it's really hard to focus when, you know, there's just like so many different things to do for different people. Um, and then some days I do have to go to the courthouse. Like just this afternoon, I had to just make a last minute trip to the courthouse because I had gotten a call from one of the clerks and she said my client's name change was done. So I needed to go and pick up the orders. Um, I mean, she could have mailed them to me, but I don't really trust the mail around here anymore. There have been so many times when, you know, local mail took like over a week to arrive or or even two weeks to arrive. So so I don't mind. I mean, it's kind of fun having a place to go. It's like, OK, I'm going to court today. You know, what do I have to do? You know, and some days I have to go to court to file a bunch of, um, you know, file a bunch of new divorce cases or um, nowadays they do the uncontested divorces through WebEx. So um, I definitely don't go to court as much as I used to before COVID happened. Yeah. But most of my day is spent also um, having consultations with potential clients. And I do that mostly through Zoom or by phone now rather than meeting people um, in person. Yeah. Great strategy. Yes, it's good to network within your field. Yeah. Find more personal finance, small 
YouTubers. Yeah, it just seems like that. Doesn't it seem like it's kind of a dime a dozen? There seem to be so many people trying to do personal finance type channels because, you know, a lot of people, they don't really have any credentials, but they just like to talk about it. So it makes it really hard to figure out, well, wh what is a good channel? You know, like, who should I listen to? Um, I mean, you even have these people in their 20s that have finance type channels, too, and they want to give people advice so it's it's kind of hard to figure out like what's good sort of like like life coach you know <laughs> like like anybody can be on youtube and say i'm a life coach i'm gonna talk to people about how to you know how to live live a calm peaceful fulfilling life or something yeah so definitely um hopefully you can grow your channel more and more you know once people start realizing that you have good content and the delivery is good as well as your editing and everything um that creates a good visual experience for the viewers right so, oh i never learned how many hours you work per week what's your workload work hour like oh it's just so hard to say because once again it really depends whoops i'm sorry i keep kicking the table um so there's some some weeks that are absolute nightmares where I feel like I'm working. Yeah, but it's not that bad because I'm kind of at the point in my career where I do turn down cases and stuff because I'm not desperate for the money or for clients anymore. So I probably don't work more than 40 hours a week, which is great. Um, and I get to keep all the profit because, you know, it's my business and I just have like one contract worker who does some work for me remotely. So I don't have to be actually in the office or keeping track of my hours for most of my cases because a lot of my cases are a flat fee. Um, I would say, yeah, maybe it's 50-50. Yeah, maybe 50% of my cases are flat fee. So I don't really have to even keep track of what I'm doing, you know, but then some other cases, especially like the contested divorce or custody or litigation cases, then it is kind of a drag, but that's the way the business is, you know, where you have to keep track every day. It's like, what did I do for the client? Let me type it in. And, you know, how many minutes did I spend or what percentage of an hour did I spend? Yeah. So i most of the time I don't work more than 40 hours a week. Yeah, but definitely things have changed. It's been really weird with COVID happening because um, I would say that my business really dropped by at least 40% last year um, because the courts were closed part of the time. You know, things kept changing with the court rules. I think some people got laid off or, you know, like people were just kind of putting their lives on hold last year. So business definitely dropped last year. And that's another reason why I had more time to do my YouTube videos, because suddenly it's like, OK, I have this extra spare time and I'm stuck at home all the time. And I wasn't ice skating anymore, which is another big hobby of mine. So um, that's another big plus of being a solo attorney is that once you do have enough business, then as long as you get your work done, you can do what you want to do during the day. You know, it's like if I needed to get an oil change, no problem, you know, or I need to schedule my dental appointment, no problem. I'll just do it whenever. Or, um, you know, some days before COVID, I would end up having figure skating lessons. I know it sounds kind of cheesy, but um, I'm like really into figure skating. I'm a total fan of ice skating. And I used to have a coach and have lessons and compete as an adult. And I even competed in the adult national championships back in 2006. And I was going to compete again last year in Delaware, but that got, got canceled. So um, being self-employed has allowed me to pursue my hobbies and, you know, have more time for my family also. So it's everything has really been a positive um, when you work for another firm all day, what are the ways to network and when? Well, um, yeah, usually the firms will want you to network because it's also a way for them to get more business too. So it really depends on your firm. Like if they'll let you get out for lunch, which, you know, most firms do expect you to take a break for lunch, then a lot of the networking events, at least where I am in North Carolina, they take place during lunchtime. And some of the bar, um, meetings or even during breakfast, but I never went to any of them because I'm not an early riser. I mean, there's no way I was going to get up at like six something and then drive all the way to downtown Raleigh to go to some breakfast event at 730 in downtown Raleigh. Yeah. But um, all the other things like our local county bar associations, the women attorneys groups, you know, they would always have lunch meetings. So um, usually you would just like head out during lunch to go to some networking 
event and then come back and then keep working for the firm. And then, you know, of course, there are some things sometimes they might have some like after work hour, like happy hour or networking type things. But by and large, they do it during the daytime because they also realize a lot of attorneys have family obligations. So you need to get home to see your family after work instead of going to another meeting. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. You just opened your own family law practice. Yeah. Well, good luck with that. Yeah, definitely. Um, family law has, has been a very lucrative part of my practice. And I mean, Sometimes I mean I enjoy it. Sometimes it can be very stressful depending on the personalities of your clients. So um, you know, it, it just takes some time, some experience when you start seeing the red flags and you know what kind of clients that you don't want versus you know what kind of clients would be the time type that you would like to work with. And then, you know, it just as you get more experience, you'll be able to get better clients too. Yeah. But um good luck. And I'm I'm sure it's probably gonna work out. Yeah, because that at least where I am, it, it has been pretty, pretty good for business to do family law. Yeah. Um, do you miss having a team? Do you have any? Yeah, um, that part, I, I sort of do a little bit, but not really to the point where I think about it anymore, because it was really weird suddenly being out on my own. But um, at the beginning, I did rent office space with two other attorneys. And there was also a real estate professional in our office suite. And then the landlord, who was also one of the attorneys in my suite, um, he had a paralegal who sat at the front desk. So that was kind of good because when people came in, you know, at least there was somebody there in the waiting room to greet people and tell them, oh, hi, you know, you're here to see Judy Singh and, you know, please have a seat and I'll tell her you're here, you know, so it was very professional. And so I didn't really feel that lonely, you know, back then because I still had people around me. And one of the other attorneys in my suite was my former coworker at another firm that I had worked for when I first moved to North Carolina. So that was great, you know, having her around. And then sometimes we go out to lunch or just talk about our cases a little bit. Yeah. But then um, later on, I switched to other offices that were closer to where I lived. And then I didn't really have a team at all. Even when I shared office space with other people, like they were all doing their own thing. Like one time I was in this like, group of financial advisors. So I think they expected me to refer clients to them, but I never had any clients that had much money to, you know, refer over to them. So it did seem kind of alienating because I just go there and, you know, we just say hi, if we saw each other in the back mail room, but, or, you know, just walking in the hallway of the office building, but that's about it. Yeah. So sometimes it does get a little lonely. Um, I do have one assistant who works, um, you know, remotely part-time. So um, we do talk during the day or email each other. And sometimes, you know, we actually talk on the phone and stuff. Um, but, you know, after a while, it's like, it's okay, because you kind of realize that when you're working in a big office with lots of other people, then you end up wasting so much extra time making chit chat, you know, <laughs> like probably a lot of people who are working from home now have noticed this also, like sometimes you can be a lot more productive when you're not distracted by other people in the office, you know, coming in and out of your office or, you know, then having to go out to eat lunch with them that takes out another hour to hour and a half of your day, you know, when you could just get work done and then go home earlier. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I've, pretty much gotten used to, you know, being my own, you know, just one, one person show. Um, so it, it's okay. Yeah, there are pluses and minuses, but I think it's mostly a plus to just work by yourself and not have to deal with more personalities and more personal conflicts. So yeah. Um, yeah, litigation practice with doubt. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, at least um, in my experience, it, it definitely was because I kind of feel like you know, when COVID happened, like everybody was kind of shell shocked and just like hiding out at home and just putting things on the back burner. Yeah, definitely with things like, um, say, divorce, divorce cases. You know, I, I have heard from people in general that, you know, it was hard on their marriages and tough, but, you know, they had to stick together because of the kids, you know, kids not being in school or maybe somebody got laid off or had their hours cut or something happened with the job so that the family wasn't doing as well financially. So they couldn't get divorced or they want to just wait, you know, wait it out or something. Yeah. So, um, but things seem to be like speeding up back to normal now, at least where I am, you know, from what I've seen. Yeah. Thank you for being here. 
Um, let's see. Oh yeah, you left the drama of divorce and okay, well good. Then that's that's your calling then. Yeah, because sometimes there is a bit too much drama in divorce and uh, drama in divorce and family law. So, you know, I don't know, you just have to learn how to set your boundaries. That's that's what I have to say. Oh, and I did want to go down a list of some more of the little tidbits of advice that I have. Oh, uh, let me answer this question here. Does that mean you have to do copying, punching, mailing? I hate gossip with the admin work. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So there have definitely been times that I was like just like scanning a bunch of documents. And, um, you know, in my vlogs, you'll see me constantly going to the post office, you know, buying more stamps and, and I have to buy more envelopes. And then I have to order my own stationery and, you know, keep track of my client billing and everything. Yeah. So I have to do all that unglamorous part of of being an attorney but you know that's okay yeah i mean it's all right to me especially when you're your own boss and you have a lot of autonomy and you get to keep all the profits to yourself so you know it, it works out yeah i mean i'm definitely um glad not to work in any sort of like gossipy work environment um not not like my work environments were that gossipy but um you know, I do remember like at one of the firms I worked at, there was a legal assistant that I really couldn't stand because she was so moody and weird. And some days she would just be so rude. And that would just make me really mad the rest of the day when I had to put up with her weird tempers and her like grouchiness. So, um, yeah, I mean, I was really glad when she finally found another job and left. So <laughs> anyway, but that kind of like ruined my um office experience at that firm for quite a while for probably at least like half a year to a year until she finally quit but yeah i'm, I'm so glad not to deal with office politics um you know originally i had thought about starting up a law firm with several other attorney friends but i think it's for the best that we all went our separate ways did our own things and you know everybody's doing well now one of them is actually um a partner at a bigger firm now and um, the other person has her own law firm. The other person, another person also has his own firm. And I think he works with like maybe one or two other attorneys, um, pretty successful also. So, and we've all remained, uh, you know, uh, on friendly terms, which is great because I have heard of a lot of people who went into partnership with their friends or somebody they knew from law school. And then they had a big falling out and were fighting over the cases or, you know, threatening lawsuits against each other and stuff. So anyway, I, I think like Life has been easier with me just being a solo. Oh, it's hard to be a female minority attorney. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I have this like much older live stream show called Racism in the Legal Profession, where I mentioned that, um, you know, there were times that people were just rude or racist towards me. Um, especially this other Chinese woman who who said that her husband wanted them to find some like white America or American attorney to represent them in this lawsuit after she had like wasted my time repeatedly um, trying to get free legal advice from me. So um, needless to say, I'm no longer friends with that person and haven't talked to her in many years. Um, yeah, so it is it is definitely hard. I mean, I'm also in this like area where. Um, there aren't that many Asian American attorneys, but recently I did get an email saying that somebody was trying to start up a triangle area Asian American attorney group. So we're supposed to have our virtual Zoom meeting in another week or two. So um, so that's nice. I mean, there definitely are slightly more and more Asian American attorneys where I am. Um, where I came from up in DC, that was really not that big of a deal because there are a lot more, um, you know, there's a lot more diversity up around DC. And we had a very, very active Asian Pacific American Bar Association in Washington, DC. So it was kind of like a culture shock to move to North Carolina 20 years ago, and then just kind of look around and see that, okay, I guess I am a minority. And everywhere I go, you know, nobody thinks that I'm the attorney. And, um, you know, but I, I think like, Slowly but surely, you know, more and more people's attitudes are cha changing or they're beginning to realize that, look, you know, there are more women attorneys now. I think more than 50 percent of the law school students or law school graduates are now women anyway. And, um, you know, I mean, I, I have a very diverse clientele, people of all races and backgrounds from all sorts of different countries around here. And there have been more and more 
um, Asians or Asian Americans moving into Wake County, into the Triangle area. So this area has become more diverse and um, especially a lot of Asian Indian families around here. So, um, so I'm very happy to be here and just serve whoever is willing to have me as their attorney. And I do feel like some you know, ethnic minorities, they do feel more comfortable with me representing them because they feel like I'm going to be honest with them, which I always try to be. And I'm accessible and, you know, I'm not an intimidating person and, you know, I don't talk down to them. So anyway, yeah, it, it is tough to be a minority female attorney. Um, but, you know, I mean, luckily I, I have managed to find a decent number of clientele who either don't care that I am an Asian American female attorney, or they actually are happy to have some sort of like Asian American female attorney. So, um, oh yeah, have to buy cream puffs. Yeah, yeah, I guess all the time I, I'm always in my vlogs, I end up going to Boba Baba Cafe and drinking bubble tea and buying cream puffs or mochi donuts or something. Yeah, I think I need to like start eating healthier foods in my videos. Yeah. Does Avo help you? Nah, no. Avo, um, this is what I've heard from other attorneys also. Like once you claim your profile or you start like using your account on Avo, then you are, you're going to start getting phone calls and emails galore from their representatives because they want you to actually pay to maybe have like your profile higher or something. I don't know. I mean, I do not do any of those like internet marketing type things. Yeah, so I definitely don't do any of that. I mean, some people say that it's good, but um, but Becky Moriello, the guest from last Sunday's legal live stream, she agreed with me that advertising was usually a waste of money. You know, like she gets her clients through word of mouth and referrals from other attorneys. And same here, I get my clients through referrals from other attorneys. Some people find me on the internet just through Google, and then other people find me through the legal plans that I'm part of. Yeah. So originally, when I started my practice, I was paying um, close to $100 a month so that I could be high up on the employment lawyers. Um, under, I think it was Find Law. I'm pretty sure it was Find Law. It was one of those like legal search type websites. But, you know, all I got maybe were like a couple of consultations out of there. But a lot of the other things like um, my last law firm used Legal Match and we very rarely got anybody good, any decent people through there. Because, I mean, why does anyone really need to use like a website to help them match up with an attorney anyway. I mean, most people just use Google or they ask their friends for a recommendation. So um, so that's why after, I would say like after about a year of paying money to find law or some website like that, then I, I just stopped doing it because it, it was a waste of money to me. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, I, I should mention this because this is a really good piece of advice. I'm a big fan of um, CNA Gillsbar Pro for legal malpractice insurance. And I found this out. I don't even know how I found it out. Maybe some other attorney had told me about it. So I'm going to put it in the chat box here. Yeah, so this is the company that I've been using for legal malpractice insurance for a really long time, probably for like more than 10 years now. And I'm very happy with it. And I only have to pay a fraction of what I would have had to pay with Lawyers Mutual. Um, so Lawyers Mutual is the big legal malpractice insurance company that a lot of people use in North Carolina. And they do a lot of like advertising and continuing legal ed type classes and stuff. Um, but, you know, when, when I was opening up my own practice and I was hardly making any money, I was still paying maybe like over $1,200 a year for legal malpractice insurance. And I had never had any like bar complaint or any legal malpractice lawsuits or anything. But because I think it's also because I practice family law. So family lawyers are very prone to having bar complaints or people like threatening to sue them or something when you don't get them what they want. <laughs> so, um, so there are certain practice areas that are going to make your legal malpractice 
insurance cost more. So um, then somebody must have told me about this CNA Gills Bar Pro. And um, so I'm paying just a fraction of what I would be paying if I had stuck with Lawyers Mutual. So sorry to anybody who might be watching this who works for Lawyers Mutual, but the prices were just getting too ridiculous. So I really recommend this other company. Yeah. Oh, hi, Lisa D. Thank you for being here. Yeah. So um, anyway, there's still some more tidbits of advice that I wrote down here. OK, so you want to keep your overhead as low as possible. Um, try to share office space with other attorneys. Um, that's the best way, especially if they're the types that don't do the kind of law that you do so that you can refer cases to each other. And sometimes people ask about virtual offices. And there are companies like Office Suites Plus and Regis and WeWork around this area where I am. And I looked into a couple of those companies already in the past. And with all the add-on costs, you know, they usually charge you like a big chunk of money up front. And then if you want to have more time in the conference room or, you know, whatever, you know, if you want to have their receptionist help you out answering phones, then they charge you more. You know, if you want more use of the office or you want your own personal office, you know, it, it just like there were so many like extra hidden costs that I felt kind of bamboozled or tricked because when I saw their ads, this was back when I was looking, was looking for office space on Craigslist. Yeah, when you saw their ads, they would make it sound like, oh, you know, it's like less than $300 a month or whatever. But then after you go in there and you get the sales pitch from their representatives, then it's like, oh my gosh, you know, this is gonna cost a lot more for the office space. So for less than that amount, I was able to rent the office suite and share a conference room and have the, the woman, the receptionist that was sitting out there in the waiting room, you know, at the first two offices that I rented space from. And um, at my first office space, the rent was only about like $400 a month. Um, of course, that was 15 years ago. And then the second office space, I was only paying like $315 a month. It was incredible. I mean, the building was gorgeous. You know, it was just like fancy class A office space. But um, the reason they rented it out to me for so cheap was because um, it was that financial services business where they just happened to have an extra little office anyway. So otherwise they weren't going to make any money off of it. And they probably did hope that I was going to start referring clients towards their way. So. Anyway, so I did wind up getting really good deals on office space. Um, so right now I'm still paying less than $600 a month for my office space. But there are some attorneys I know who complain to me and they're telling me, oh, well, you know, my office rent is $2,000 a month or my office rent is whatever, you know, close to $3,000 a month. I'm like, why? You know, do you really need to have your whole entire office suite? I mean, I guess there are some people who really want to grow their law practice like an empire where they're going to have multiple associates and a bunch of paralegals and, you know, have this like giant revenue generating law firm. But to me, you know, after a while, I realized, you know, I'm happy with the way things are. I don't feel like I want to hire an associate or hire a full time paralegal. You know, then I'm going to have to be in the office all the time supervising them or making sure that they're working. And, you know, I like my freedom. So things are I'm very happy with the way things worked out. Yeah. Um, OK, so um, so in terms of keeping your overhead as low as possible, you definitely don't want to hire anybody until it's absolutely necessary. So, um, you know, I think that if you do need help, the first thing you should do is try to um, get like a part time person or a contractor so that you don't have to deal with all the tax and payroll issues and stuff. You know, ha having someone as just like contractor is a lot easier than having a full fledged employee. And then, you know, gradually work your way up to having a part-time employee or a full-time employee if your business is so thriving that you really need um, to have that extra help. Yeah. But um, in terms of hiring a full-fledged attorney, like an associate, I think that's, that's a really big um, task to take on. And I read somewhere that it, it's sort of like having a kid because when you have a have an employee or an associate, then you are going to have to be like watching over them and making sure what they're doing is correct and, and proofreading and rereading and mentoring, looking over their work and talking to them. And, you know, and then this is the part that I hate the most is that if I had an associate 
or a paralegal, then I'm going to have to be stuck in the office. And that's exactly why I hated working for other people, because there was no flexibility or very little flexibility. You feel like you have to be there before nine o'clock every day. And then you have to stay there the whole day until at least 530, if not like later after 630 or even seven. So why would I want to do that? You know, I have other things that I want to do in my life, you know, with this whole COVID. I'm sure everybody's been reexamining their lives and thinking like, what do I really want to do? Does, does this job make me happy? Do I want to change my job? Do I want to spend more time with my family? Are there things that I've always wanted to do, but I couldn't do because I was working and stuck in the office all the time? So, um, so yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's the, the positive thing about being an attorney and a solo attorney who has managed to build a pretty decent business is to have that choice and the freedom, you know, to decide like, well, today I am going to, you know, go help out my sister with her kids, you know, or today I am going to, you know, do such and such instead of, you know, just being stuck in the office from nine to six o'clock, you know. So, so that's just my feeling. I mean, some people love working and they love the law. They love going to trial, being in court every day, or, you know, they want to build their legal empire with a whole cadre full of um, attorneys. You know, they want to be a name partner or something. But after a while, you know, having my own practice, I, I just don't have those kinds of aspirations. To me, that doesn't sound like something fun to me. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. You've been very open and honest about what the legal profession looks like. Yeah, it's not like the Suits show. I've actually never even watched the Suits, uh, Suits, but yeah, I mean, there's just a lot of grunt work, a lot of sitting in front of the computer and then talking on the phone. And then sometimes you do feel like a therapist too, when especially when you're dealing with family law clients. Yeah. So can JDs who recently graduated but can't find jobs just become paralegals or legal assistant? Yeah, they can, but from what I've heard, a lot of firms don't want to hire them anyway, because if the job opening is really for a paralegal, then they're going to just think that someone with a JD is eventually going to pass a bar exam and constantly be looking for a real attorney job. So why would the law firm want to hire a law graduate to do a paralegal or legal assistant type job? Yeah, because the legal assistant jobs, at least where I am, they pay a lot less than attorney jobs. So um you know, it really depends on the firm, but my rough guess is that like legal assistants might make 30,000 a year. I don't know, 30 to 60,000 if they're at a bigger firm, maybe. Yeah. But, but yeah, everything that I've heard says that law firms typically will just like toss away the resume if it's someone who graduated from law school because they don't want someone that is still going to be looking for a real attorney job the whole time and looking to jump ship at the drop of a hat. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you for being here, Dr. Sav. Um, JDs without a bar can work as law clerks or document review. Yeah, that's, that's very true. Yeah. And um, so I have heard of some people who couldn't pass the bar exam and then they ended up doing compliance or working for banks, reviewing documents or contract review. Yeah. I don't know anyone personally that does it, but I do know like friends of friends or acquaintances of friends who, um, who managed to find jobs within banks doing something that pays pretty well and is kind of low stress, but you know, it doesn't require a law license. Yeah. So there are some options, you know, I mean, eventually people have to do what they need to do. And as one of my old friends did, he ended up working for McDonald's management track because he couldn't stand practicing law anymore. Yeah. So, um, okay. So we've already covered, uh, my other tip was, you know, don't waste money on advertising. You should, in my opinion, you should have a website at least, at the very least. And of course, you want to have your business cards because people still do hand out business cards when you go to court or you go to continuing legal ed classes or lunches where you might be networking with other attorneys. So you always have to have business cards and you should put your um, additional information as to what your practice area is so people will remember you and know what kind of cases to refer to you. Um, I think that my key like I said, the key to getting clients or good clients was 
to network like crazy, which I really did a lot of when I was a younger attorney, um, especially when I didn't have that many clients. So I would go to all these like lo local Wake County Bar Association lunches. Um, even before that, I was going to Durham County Bar Association lunches. The women attorneys groups always have like monthly lunch meetings with speakers. So I don't always go there also. Um, some groups or some bar associations also do have like a minorities in the profession group. Um, I was even going to the Triangle Area Latino Attorney Network lunches because I'm friends with the woman who founded that group. And so, um, you know, everywhere you go, you just don't know like who is going to wind up being friendly towards you to become a good friend of yours or a source of referrals. So it's just important to get your name out there and let people know that you're ready and willing and you really want these cases. And at the beginning, I really didn't charge that much compared to other attorneys who had been out of law school for six years at that time. And I mean, it did help me get cases, but it didn't give me good quality clients, though, because, I mean, I was kind of like scraping the bottom of the barrel sometimes, and I would get these people who, you know, they still demand just as much of your time and everything, but yet you're giving them a huge discount and not asking for enough money up front. So a lot of times I did get screwed over where these people would just like run over their retainer deposits, and then I'd ask for another one. And then they drag their feet and have excuses. And meanwhile, there's still more work that I still have to do on their case. And they're still emailing me and bugging me. So there were a few times that I got stuck where, um, or got screwed over where the person just never paid their last bill, never replenished their retainer deposit. So um, gradually, I learned my lesson more and more to charge more. So um, you know, as soon as you're able to build up that clientele and you have the experience, then you should charge more and demand more money up front so you don't wind up holding the bag and these people just don't respect you anyway and you'll just get these like low class low quality clients that um you know still gripe and complain and want refunds or don't want to pay your last bill so um so that's one thing i've definitely learned over the years is that you need to charge people what you're worth and don't give free consultations i mean unless you're in a specific field of law where everybody gives free consultations in your market. You know, like here, it's the personal injury attorneys, the workers' comp, social security disability, and bankruptcy attorneys that will give free consultations. But people, the general public sees those types of ads on TV or on billboards, and then they expect every attorney to give them a free initial consultation. But that's not the way it works in my market. You know, at least around here, pretty much all the good family lawyers, everybody does, as far as I know. You know, everybody charges for a consultation. I mean, some of the newer attorneys might charge like a much lower rate for their initial consultations. Like I've seen ads where people say, oh, you know, $99 for the initial consultation. Or actually, I think I have heard of some family lawyers around here who give free initial phone consultations, but I'm sure they put a strict limit on that because otherwise people could talk your ear off for more than an hour and then you still haven't made anything. So, um, Anyway, I mean, my advice in general is that you should charge for consultations. Don't just keep giving away your time for free because that's how most attorneys make a living, you know, unless you're doing a personal injury case on a contingency fee basis. Yeah. Um, has your practice increased after you've been on YouTube? No, it hasn't. <laughs> yeah, YouTube has actually been kind of like... Um, in terms of time and money, it's just been a negative. <laughs> yeah, but I'm having fun. You know, this became my hobby after I couldn't ice skate anymore and after I was stuck at home all the time since last March. So um, I've really enjoyed being on YouTube. It's like my source of kind of fun and connecting with some, you know, new friends over the internet and stuff. Um, being part of YouTuber support groups has been great. But the only thing that really happened was that, um, I think I got like a couple of emails from people who were looking for attorneys, but they weren't even anywhere near where I'm located and where I practice. So I just, you know, probably referred them to somebody else or told them they needed to find somebody in their city. So, um, yeah, and then I've been contacted by a handful of like, um, you know, younger students who are thinking about going to law school which um, unfortunately, you know, I, I just don't have time to do a lot of, you know, one-on-one -on -one 
communications and emailing back and forth with people who want to know whether they should go to law school or something. So that's why I did that video <laughs> where I made up my own quiz about should you go to law school? Yeah. So um, yeah, but otherwise YouTube has just cost me money because I've had to, you know, go out and buy my equipment, the microphone, the lighting set and, you know, pay for my editing software. And um, I'm supposed to finally get a payout from Google AdSense because I got monetized back in late February, but I haven't actually seen the money hit my account yet, but it'll be very exciting when I finally get paid something. Yeah. Oh, vlogging or blogging, did it get you client? Nope. <laughs> no, I have not gotten any clients whatsoever from doing any of this. And in fact, um, I don't know. I mean, who knows? Maybe, maybe doing this YouTube channel doesn't look too professional because you know, it's not really geared towards me getting clients because you'll see on YouTube, there are some attorneys and law firms that have set up YouTube channels and their goal is very obviously to get clients because their videos are all, you know, very serious and talking about the law, um, you know, talking about your rights and when you need to see an attorney and stuff like that. Yeah, but I wanted my channel to just kind of be more personal where I can just kind of be myself. And it's not really about getting clients anyway, because I think like most people who are looking for an attorney, they're not going to be searching on YouTube for an attorney anyway. So, so it lets me be free and kind of act goofy and say almost whatever I want, you know, cause some of my videos, you know, were not very professional looking or, you know, were kind of down on going to law school and stuff. So that's not something that I really want clients to see, but you know, I mean, I, I just feel like it's a creative outlet. So, um, so yeah, this channel is not really a marketing scheme for me to get more business. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I'm trying to show more because I realized like a lot of my vlogs just show me sitting in the car talking. So I think that's getting a little boring, you know, sit in the car talking, then I go to my office, and then I go to the post office, and then I go get some food or bubble tea and show you guys the food, you know, so that's, I think it's getting a little boring. So I'm trying to show more scenes outside of the car, but I think people also like seeing food. So maybe I'll continue showing a little bit of food or sites around Raleigh or Durham or Cary also. Yeah. Thank you so much for being supportive. Um, okay. So looking at my list of more advice. Um, yep. You should definitely cut down your practice areas. And um, so last week, Becky, the other attorney, Becky Moriello said that you should definitely niche down, niche down your, your legal practice. So it's sort of like a YouTube channel too. You know, if you want to do a YouTube channel, then you really need to niche down so people know what your channel is all about. So same thing with a law practice. Like you don't want to be that attorney who claims to do like 10 different areas of law. And sometimes I do see some young attorneys um, you know, they have some sort of like bare bones website and then they have like a list of like 10 different types of law that they claim that they do. I'm like, come on, you know, I'm not going to go to you if I have a potential medical malpractice client or, you know, I'm not going to go to you if my acquaintance here needs an immigration attorney. You know, I'm, I'm going to be looking for someone like Be Becky Moriello or one of my other friends who are board certified in immigration law because that's very technical and it changes all the time. So people need specialists. And then I think about myself, well, I do more than one type of law. You know, I do general civil litigation, um, you know, random things for people that come to me through the legal plans, civil litigation defense, divorce. Um, although I'm really trying to cut out custody because I just have found that child custody cases are the most stressful for me. So, um, you know, I, I'm probably not going to take on any more child custody cases anymore, which is very freeing. You know, it kind of feels good to say like, yeah, I'm through with that. You know, I want to focus more on mediating cases. And I also do employment discrimination cases. So, you know, I don't think I really need to cut out employment law because I don't even get that many employment or good employment law cases anyway. And people refer those cases to me because there are very few plaintiff side employee or employment discrimination attorneys, especially attorneys with experience representing federal employees. So that's another niche area that I've gotten um, pretty experienced at. So I get referrals from other attorneys, you know, to do federal employment law cases. So, um, so I guess that kind of counts as like maybe three areas of law that I handle. And I just never really wanted to just cut it so far down to say, okay, I'm only going to do divorce. 
or I'm only going to do, you know, employment law, you know, because I, I just wasn't really getting tons and tons of cases as an employment lawyer. But at the very beginning, though, I, I did take on too many different types of cases and I gradually phased out doing personal injury and um, stop doing the SSDI and workers' comp cases because I quickly realized that those are the kinds of cases that should be handled by the slightly bigger firms where they have paralegals or legal assistants who can do all the hand holding and all the, you know, the phone calls, filling out forms, you know, requesting medical records. Yeah, I just didn't have the capacity or the desire to, um, you know, take on those cases, which, um, you know, would also require a lot of work with maybe a payout at the end because those cases are done on a contingency fee basis. So yeah, you definitely want to cut down your practice areas so that you become more known as um, the go-to person for certain types of cases. Yeah. Um, let's see. Professional doesn't mean you have to wear a suit. You're <laughs> yeah. I mean, there are some times that I was wearing a suit too, but you know, most of the time it's like, I don't want to wear this suit because it makes me feel like hot and uncomfortable and like all bunchy, you know, that's another thing. I like working from home a lot. So I've gotten so used to wearing comfortable clothes, you know, like leggings and a t-shirt and I don't really like dry cleaning clothes or wearing formal suits and stuff because it's all so uncomfortable. You can't really move around well. And then in the end, it's bad for the environment because then you have to take it to be dry cleaned. So anyway, yeah. So I, I just rarely wear suits, especially now that it's getting so hot. So you won't be seeing me wear a suit unless I had to go to court. Yeah. So, <laughs> oh, that's right. So you remember Becky's advice, the riches are in the niches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I like how you're advising most attorneys stick to old school language and I'm like, shut up because Clive is yawning. Okay. So silence, are, are you an attorney or are you a law student? I'm just wondering. Um, lawyers should be friendly, but yay, client, you better pay because we're not for free. Yeah, that is so true. And I'll bring up some of these like, um, I don't know, aphorisms that I've heard that are pretty appropriate or good advice too. That's my question. Being niche helps. That's what even I am realizing. I not financially viable. Oh, it's not financially viable to be jack of all trades. Yep. Yep. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Feel free to tell me more about yourself too. Um, Cause I always like I kind of wonder like, Oh, you know, who's really watching this and what kind of video should I be making? Because sometimes it seems like the people who are commenting on my videos are my YouTuber friends who also have their own YouTube channels, but most of them, or, or none of them are attorneys, or very few of them are attorneys. They're like people who have cooking channels or, you know, talk about fashion, so, uh, or talk about finance. So I don't know what I'm really supposed to be doing to try to get more viewership or whatever. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you are an attorney. Okay, great, great. So what kind of law do you practice, if you don't mind saying? Yeah. So, um, okay. So let me get back to this list here. Um, okay, so cut down your practice areas. Oh, of course, you want to do a great job for your clients. I mean, that kind of sounds like, duh, you know, of course, I would do a great job for my clients. Um, but again, as Becky and I discussed last week, um, you know, the number one complaint that clients make to the bar are because their attorney did not communicate with them. Like the attorney would never tell them what's going on with their case. And I've had other clients tell me that too, that their previous attorney wouldn't respond to their emails or wouldn't respond to their phone calls. And it was always up to them to just keep prodding their attorney to try to get an update on what's going on with the case and stuff. So um, I try to I try to be really good about that. I mean, sometimes it's harder than harder on certain days. Like if I'm stuck in court all day and then I look down at my phone and this other client just keeps emailing, you know, cause everybody has those kinds of clients that are more high maintenance or really riled up, especially ones that are like, you know, divorce or custody clients, you know? So, I mean, the way that I tend to handle is I try to respond immediately to my clients' emails and this might not really be the right thing to do, but in the past, I would just like respond even when it's like 10 o'clock at night or even when it's on the weekend. But some other attorneys say, no, you shouldn't do that because then you set up that expectation where the client expects you to be at their beck and call. And they're going to assume that even though it's Sunday, you're still going to respond to their email or you're still going to call them back on a Saturday. Um, 
Yeah, but then there are other firms, like I've seen other firms say on their website that they're going to charge time and a half or double the time for anything that occurs after normal business hours or on the weekends. So I never did that because, you know, to me, I don't really mind working on weekends that much because I think things are a lot calmer on weekends. Um, yeah, but in general, I mean, most of the time, if I'm not totally swamped, then I try to respond immediately to my clients' emails and try to call them back. And even if I'm stuck in a court hearing, you know, a lot of times I would just, you know, on my phone, I would just like write a message back to the client and say, hey, I'm in court right now. I can call you after five o'clock or, you know, let's schedule a time to talk tomorrow. You know, just as long as you respond a little bit, you know, just to let them know, look, I got your message. You know, I will get back with you or let's just let's just schedule a time to talk on Friday, you know, so um, that way they still feel like you're there and you're not just totally ignoring them. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you're an immigration attorney. You want to start your own practice. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I, I guess you already saw the show from, from last Sunday with um, the other attorney who does immigration law then. Yeah. It's um, it can be very lucrative, but you definitely need to know what you're doing. Um, my sister was also an immigration lawyer for a while, but um, now she no longer practices. Um, but she was lucky to work for like a mid-sized firm that, um, you know, provided good mentorship. Yeah. But she would always tell me, yeah, th there's so many attorneys that don't really know what they're doing and they still claim that they do immigration law, but they're just like screwing over people and messing up their cases. So, okay. So another tip is that you need to stay on top of billing. Okay. The retainers and the trust accounting. Yeah. Because at one of the firms that I used to work for, one of the partners said, the bar only cares about money. You know, never mishandle your client's money or mishandle your trust funds. Like the bar doesn't care if attorneys sleep with their clients or do drugs or whatever. But the only thing that they care about is mishandling money. Yeah. So um, this I also um, have heard some other attorneys had problems with, you know, where they would not routinely bill their clients. And that's terrible because when you don't routinely bill your clients, if you're charging them by the hour, then you're going to get in over your head and get into those bad situations I mentioned where the clients already run down the retainer and they're going negative and you're still doing work and there's still a hearing coming up, but yet the client isn't giving you more money immediately. Yeah. So, um, so it is pretty tough, but um, definitely you want to bill your clients. You know, if, if it's an active case, you want to bill them at least every month, if not more frequently, or just ask for a bigger retainer deposit up front. So you don't have to constantly be on the edge of your seat, wondering if they're really going to bring over that next retainer deposit. So, okay. Excuse me. Okay. So, um, yeah. So stay on top of billing. Um, always follow your state bar's trust accounting rules. Um, here in North Carolina, you have to be very careful about not intermingling your trust account money, which is money that a client gave you that you haven't actually earned yet, as well as your, you know, don't mix it up with your operating account money. Um, so here are some sayings that I've heard from other attorneys and read in other books for people wanting to start their own solo law practices. Okay, this one was kind of funny. It says, if you do work pro bono, soon you will be living pro bono. <laughs> so I guess that basically means that if you start working for free, then you're going to end up having having a standard of living where you have no money. Yeah. So um and then it might be in the same book. I think this was like one of those like seminal books about how to hang your own shingle. I read it back in like, I don't know, 2006, 2005. But um, so it's kind of outdated now. I don't even remember the exact title about that, but it had something to do with how to hang your own shingle. Um, the author wrote something like giving free advice is like giving a dog cheese. Soon the dog will just keep coming back for more free cheese. <laughs> and that, I have found it's true because, um, you know, sometimes you feel like you want to be nice to people, especially if you had some sort of connection with them or you met them at some other networking group. But um, then if you start answering their questions for free and answering their phone calls and talking with them without 
charging them, then they're going to just be like, oh, yeah, yeah, this, this person is nice. I think uh, anytime I have a problem or I'll tell my friend, any anytime they have a problem, then Judy, the YouTube lawyer, will just talk to you. So just give her a call, you know. And I remember feeling screwed over a bunch of times early on in my practice because, um, for example, one time there's this um, friend of mine who had a coworker with a divorce problem. And so she told me about him and stupid me, you know, I was like, oh, OK, you know, I'll call this guy. So I called the guy and then he talked my ear off for, you know, 45 minutes or something and then never hired me. So I felt totally screwed over. I'm like, what the heck? You know, I really need the money. I'm not making anything today. And yet this person just got a free consultation out of me. So what did I do? Why did I do that? You know, why was I being nice? You know, this wasn't even a friend. It was like co-worker of my friend. So, um, so yeah, you just have to learn to put your foot down immediately. And, um, you know, when it, that's why it's so much more helpful if you have like someone that can help you with your phone calls, help screen the potential clients and tell them, you know, sure, you know, you can schedule a time to meet with the attorney and the consultation fee is going to be blah, 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 you know, whatever your consultation fee is. That way they will actually treat it like it's a professional relationship and they'll probably respect you more and you'll actually make a living. Yeah. So, um, Okay, disappointed by my senior attorney because she doesn't allow me to do certain types of cases. It's annoying to talk. Yeah, yeah, sometimes people do feel like, you know, they can't take it anymore. They're sick and tired of working at their law firm and, you know, they just really want to start their own practice. It's true. So, I mean, that can certainly be doable, but make sure you have a plan, you know, like where are you going to be, you know, how are you going to get clients? Do you, do you know enough? Um, do you have enough experience to handle cases from start to finish? Um, do you have money saved up? So um, so definitely, again, that's why sometimes it is better to at least share office space with other attorneys that you can sort of be friendly with and maybe help each other out or refer cases to each other and share the overhead expenses too. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, yeah. Okay. So um, yeah, so here's another saying that I remember reading in one of those like um, help for would be solo books it said the secret is to care but not too much yeah so I think that is really good advice because sometimes being a lawyer especially when you have individuals for clients or do family law or you know say immigration law you know you have to do a lot of client contact and you're dealing with people on such a personal basis and you get to know their families and stuff and you can get really caught up in the emotions of all their legal problems and it takes over your life and stuff. And this happened to me so many times, you know, where every time I took on a case, you know, there was a chance that this person's problems would just engulf my life too, to the point where I couldn't stop thinking about their case or I would be, you know, out and about driving home from work and still thinking about the person's case or, you know, going to the restroom, getting ready for bed and still thinking about the person's problems and I couldn't bill for it. Yeah. So you want to care, you want to empath empathize with your clients and everything, but not too much. And this is what I see, like some, especially women attorneys have this problem from what I've heard. Um, there was this one woman that I sort of knew through a women attorneys group and she confided in me that she had only made $22,000 the previous year from her own solo practice. And she said, the problem is, is that I've become friends with my clients. And um, yeah, there was this one client who, um, you know, was sort of like my friend and everything. And now she owes me money. So I'm like, the client is not your friend. Do not ever think that your clients are your friends at all. This is a professional business relationship. So they don't need to be coming over to your home or you don't need to be going over to their home. And I guess I should talk about that also because there are some attorneys who just operate out of their homes and they don't think that's a problem or something. But um, yeah, you, you don't want to be friends with your clients. And I guess you'll quickly learn your lesson after you practice for a couple of years that, you know, there's going to be a lot of people who might seem really nice at first, but then later on you kind of, you know, see the ugly side of them because you're seeing people in very stressful situations or if you don't get them what they want, then they'll get mad at you 
or they will just think that, well, you charge me too much, so I don't need to pay the last bill, or, you know, I don't think you did a good job. So, you know, I'm willing to give you half, you know? So, I mean, I've, unfortunately I have seen this bad side of people too many times. So it has made me a bit jaded in the last 15 years, you know, but you have to really, I don't know, maybe this is why a lot of lawyers end up being depressed or having drinking problems or going to see therapists or have to take take psychiatric medications or something. But sometimes it is very stressful because people are just dumping all their problems on you and they're expecting you to solve their problems and then they can turn on you at the drop of a hat. So, um, so yeah, don't be friends with your clients. Don't care too much about their problems. Just think that there's always two sides to each story and then you know, you'll see it, the more clients you deal with that, um, you know, you can't allow yourself to get caught up in the drama of things because otherwise you'll go crazy yourself or, you know, just not be objective enough to assess people's cases. Yeah. Oh, what legal YouTube channels do you enjoy? Well, actually, I, I watch some of them, but like, some days I do feel too overwhelmed because there are so many like YouTube channels to watch. And I'm in some of these like um, YouTube channel, YouTuber support groups where people are really friendly and we watch each other's stuff, but sometimes it's just overwhelming. It's like, oh great, this person like just uploaded a video. I, I guess I need to watch it because, you know, this person watches my videos, you know? So it gets a little overwhelming. So, you know, once in a while I do watch some of Legal Eagles videos, like he has a huge channel. I'm not even sure if he still practices law anymore, but I would guess he doesn't because how could he have time to do all the research and then produce these like really well produced um, videos. He, who knows how many subscribers he has now, probably over a hundred thousand subscribers. Yeah, so sometimes I have watched some of the Legal Eagle videos. And then last night I was um, watching some of the live stream for Wine and Chill, who is a um, young attorney, I think in New York, who talks about being in like $300,000 of debt after graduating from law school. Yeah, but she has over 11,000 subscribers. Um, sometimes I watch Aspiring Boss and Cameron Monet. And then of course my YouTuber friend TXC tells all. She was um, one of the guests on my show that featured uh, how to get a federal government attorney job. Yeah, so TXC tells all. And then um, Debt Free Dad, who was also a guest on that, live stream show, Debt Free Dad is an attorney, um, but he doesn't focus just on legal stuff on his channel. It's more about trying to you know, handle his finances and give financial advice on his channel, Debt Free Dad. Um, let me think. Yeah, so I'm subscribed to a lot of like law students who have their law school vlogs, but again, it gets to be a little bit too overwhelming when I keep getting all these notifications from all these different students who are talking about, you know, this is my day going to class, look at what I'm eating, I'm drinking coffee now, now I'm going to study, you know. <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I try to watch as much as I can because I want to support other people too. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't have tons of time, especially now, now that the COVID restrictions have been um, lifted a lot. I think there's like more stuff going on out in the real world. So I probably am not going to have as much time for YouTube. <laughs> yeah. So I'm a 1L summer intern interning for a solo litigator and it's been awesome. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it can be such a good learning experience because you're actually going to get to like tag along depending on what, what your boss is doing, you know, going to court or meeting with clients. Yeah. Because my first job out of law school was um, for a solo practitioner in Northern Virginia, and it was a really great experience, even though I was stressed out a lot and the pay wasn't that great. But, you know, just being able to go everywhere along with my boss going to court and seeing how he dealt with the clients and doing the client billing, like that was so helpful in the long run. Yeah, so I'm glad that you're doing that. Good luck with law school. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. So much. Yep. I'm still yapping away. Oh my gosh. It's been over an hour. I can't believe it. Okay. I really wish we had something like doctor's resident program and some channels to join work after that. Only reason law school is expensive. They need a plan for lawyers. Yeah. 
that's a, that's another reason why I'm kind of down on the law school industry because law school has gotten so freaking expensive. Like there's no way I could afford to send my kid to the private schools that, that my siblings and I went to, you know, that's ridiculous. You know, Georgetown is close to $70,000 a year and then you graduate and then what, you know, like it's not like the starting salaries at law firms has really increased that much compared to the cost of tuition in the last 20 years. Yeah, even the in-state or at UNC law school would be paying probably at least, I don't know, probably at least like 25000 a year for an in-stater. Yeah, so it's, it's just so ridiculously expensive. And what are the chances that people are going to get these like really high paying jobs to make it worthwhile? Yeah, Legal Eagle runs a practice in DC. Oh, okay. Well, that's really impressive. I wonder <laughs> how does he have time to like do all this research and stuff? Yeah, because even when I did this like quickie live stream about the Josh Duggar and the Duggar family um, situation, um, you know, I, I got over 2000 views on it, which was pretty amazing. That's a lot for my channel. But on the other hand, I was like, oh my God, I'm spending all this time reading about the Duggars because it had been a long time since I had been watching their reality show on TLC. So, um, so yeah, I got some like mean comments from people saying that I got the year wrong on when the show got canceled and the show didn't really get canceled. They just changed their name or something. I'm like, I didn't have time to do all this research about reality TV to put on this live stream about the Duggar family. But yeah. So anyway, yeah, even, even doing a live stream can sometimes require like one to two hours of research. So you know what you're talking about before you get up and you know, face the wrath of all these angry YouTube viewers who say that, you know, your stuff is crap and you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. So um, did you start your own because you didn't like your senior partner or because you wanted to make money and have your own time? Well, um, I did like my boss, but, um, you know, I mentioned this in the, um, this is a really old video of mine, but it's actually gotten like thousands of views called how I started my own law practice or how I started my own law firm. Yeah. So what happened was that um, my employer was not really paying much attention to, to the firm. So the paychecks started bouncing and it wasn't just my paychecks, but also, you know, the legal assistants, some of their paychecks were bouncing too. And they would tell me and they would be really mad because, you know, they didn't have enough money saved up in their bank accounts. So if their paycheck bounced, then it was like this whole domino effect of all their other, you know, bills and rent being late. So, um, so I kind of felt like the writing was on the wall that, um, I wasn't getting paid a lot anyway to work there. Um, so I tried, I tried for at least a year. I mean, even, even when I was working at the other law firms, you know, since the pay was so dismal and I just felt like really stressed out working at at least one of the law firms. So I was always trying to find other better jobs, but I really couldn't. And that was what was so shocking and depressing to me at the time, because, you know, I'm like, why did I go to law school, you know, to like get these like low paying jobs and I'm so stressed out all the time. And I would try to apply for jobs where I thought for sure I was qualified for the jobs because by then I had already had that coveted, you know, three to five years of experience. And I couldn't even get an interview for most of those jobs. And then I did get a couple of interviews with other like small to mid-sized law firms, but then I would, find out that, wait a second, they want to pay me even less than what I'm currently making at my current job. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. So there, there was this one firm that wanted to hire me and I had to go through at least two interviews before they wanted to give me the offer. And then they told me like the starting salary was something ridiculous back then. It was like $38,000. And I'm like, what the heck is this? And then I got an earful from another attorney who had worked for that same law firm about what a terrible place it was to work. So I was like, no, no way. You know, well, the main thing is that, you know, they paid even less than what I had been making at that firm I was working for at the time. And then um, there was another firm that did give me an offer. But again, like they wanted to pay me something like $41,000. And then I also heard some negative things about that firm too. So I turned that down. Then I applied for another job with a mid-sized law firm and they didn't give me the job. So they gave the job to someone else. Um, 
because I, I think I was a little too negative about my current job during the job interview. So let that be a lesson that if you're interviewing for a job, don't tell the truth about you know how awful your current job is because then you'll seem like a downer and they, they won't want to hire you. Yeah, so that's a story of why I ended up going solo. It was almost out of necessity because I knew I had no future with um, the place where I was working at the time. I mean, it was a it was a good learning experience. I mean, I still have a lot of respect for that person as an attorney and I think things are going well for that person now. But, um, you know, when, when we started having financial troubles, I was like, okay, you know, now's the time. Like I've been thinking for quite a while, like, wouldn't it be great to be self-employed and have my own practice? And I feel like I can handle the cases just as well, or if not better than the people that I used to work for. Yeah. So, oh, thank you, Debt Free Dad. Yeah, I mentioned your channel earlier. So Debt Free Dad is also an attorney in the DC area. Um, so please also look at his channel here. Oh, yeah. Angry YouTube viewer. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you've gotten any like hateful comments from people. Um, you know, there, there are just some people with like no lives who are just going to get on somebody else's YouTube channel and try to put them down or act all high and mighty and stuff. Or some people are probably really mentally ill, you know, getting on YouTube and then trash talking the people. So yeah, I've heard stories where practitioners failed to pay for their employees' health care and coverage lapsed at the time of, oh, that's horrible. Yeah. Yeah. I had a situation where, um, where my so-called employer match was not being put into my um, simple IRA either. So um, luckily that was remedied, but yeah, I mean, there, there are so many like smaller firms that are not run well, and then the poor associates end up being pretty oppressed or in addition to being not paid well. So um, yeah, it's, it's not always just like glamour and lots of money and, you know, what do you say? Like dollars, <laughs> like bottles and models, you know, working at a big law firm. It's definitely not like that in the legal profession from what I've seen. Yeah. Yeah. Don't tell the truth. <laughs> that's true. Some don't pay for health insurance and it sucks. Yeah. That is so true. You know what? Like people are always talking about how, oh, you should save in your 401k at an early age. Well, you know, I never even had the glory of working for a place that offered a 401k. So the first place I worked for didn't have anything other than some like really lousy health insurance. And I don't think I had any real vacation time either. Um, but again, you know, I learned a lot. So, you know, I gained experience and stuff. Um, so ultimately... I ended up having a simple IRA. And at the last firm I worked for, I had to set up my own simple IRA with Fidelity because otherwise the other choice was with some no name like investment company that my boss had a connection with. And it turned out the guy was taking like a huge fee as a commission every year. So I was like, this is dumb. You know, I want to save for retirement, but I don't want to invest with this guy's no name company. So, so yeah, I never had a 401k, but um, somehow through Roth IRAs and simple IRAs. And then now with um, SEP IRA, which I highly recommend you know, open up a SEP IRA with Fidelity, Schwab, or Vanguard if you're self-employed because you got to sock away as much you, as you can for retirement. Yeah. So uh, I haven't gotten hateful or angry comments, but I did get one message from someone telling me I should have handled my resin dolls with gloves. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, for true collectors, like, aren't they like really like anal retentive about how they handled their precious dolls? You know, like maybe some people really do, you know, wear special gloves before they will like open the box or handle the doll or whatever. Yeah. So Jared, if, if you guys um, aren't subscribed to Jared's channel, he has a very unique, wonderful, fun channel about um, fashion dolls, you know, Barbie dolls and fashion. It's a really great channel and he's almost getting monetized. So please help him out with his watch time. Um, and also it was recently his birthday. So he had a nice birthday live stream. Okay. So eventually I am going to finish this. So I have this like list here that I kind of wanted to go through about my little tips and stuff. Um, okay. So here's another nice aphorism that another attorney told me. A case is never as good as it looks the first time it walks through the door. And yes, that has definitely been true. Um, 
you know, and we're talking about like cases that like employment discrimination cases or personal injury cases, civil rights cases, you know, cases where you might, you know, people might expect you to do it on a contingency fee basis. But that has turned out to be so true. You have to learn how to be discerning and not try to be your client's friend. Okay. The person coming through the door is like someone that you're going to have a business relationship with, and it's not going to help you or the client. If you don't know how to properly assess the case and tell them you don't have a case, you don't need to hire an attorney. There's no need, you know, like sometimes you do have to be like really blunt and just, um, who cares if the people like you or not, they're not your friends. It's a business relationship. So, you know, sometimes I have gotten into cases where the more I delve into the case and talk to witnesses or talk to the client, I realize that, you know, maybe the client is a little bonkers or they're not telling the truth or the witnesses aren't backing up what the person has been telling me. So I just have to be honest. I mean, obviously in a kind and professional way, so they don't get pissed off at you, but you have to be honest with them. I think that's a lot more important than just trying to seem like, oh, well, I'm all out to, you know, get, get you your money and, you know, we're going to win this case or whatever. You know, you have to be objective enough to know when it's time to call it a day and say, look, I can't represent you anymore. This is why, you know, the case has a very low likelihood of success. And, um, you know, let me give you back the rest of your unused retainer deposit, you know, if there is a retainer deposit. So, um, so yeah, I mean, if you smell early on that this case doesn't sound good, or the person seems a little off, or the person is lying to you, then it would probably be to your advantage to get rid of the case as soon as possible instead of dragging it out. Because the longer you keep handling the case, the more um, likely the person is going to get mad at you when you finally say, look, I'm not going to be able to represent you in this case because, you know, for whatever reason that it turns out to be lousy case or the client is just too annoying or high maintenance or dishonest. Yeah. So um, smart move to set up your Roth group. Yep. Avoid that potential Bernie Madoff. Yes, that's right. Yeah. I just didn't have a good feeling about this financial advisor guy that my boss had us meet with. That was just like, whatever, you know, like I had already been reading about personal finance since college. So he, he really didn't have any great ideas for me. He just wanted to take a cut out of my retirement account. <laughs> yeah. Um, you spoke for a long time. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much. I wish you the best of luck with your immigration law practice. Um, are you familiar with a continuance for failure to comply with rule one? What? I laughed when I figured out what rule one was. What's rule one? <laughs> Oops, I guess I don't remember what rule one is. <laughs> continuance. Uh, well, I kind of feel like, you know, a lot of times most judges don't like to grant continuance unless the other party agrees with it, right? You're talking about the North Carolina Rules of Civil Procedure. Um, if you can tell me what what the fun thing about that is. Uh, these rules, it's the scope of the rules. Okay. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, what? The client hasn't paid. Yeah. So anyway, since you're familiar with Durham County Court, I did have to go to Durham County Court just, um, you know, earlier this year. And the judge was Judge Michael Ofuglu. I, I think I'm pronouncing that right. So I don't know if you know him or not. So he basically wanted to know why I had to withdraw from the client's case. And I had to tell him, you know, it was a payment issue. And like, originally, I always thought that you're not really allowed to just flat out say in open court why you need to withdraw. You know, normally, I would just give some sort of vague, um, you know, description in the motion saying like, uh, counsel seeks, seeks to withdraw due to reasons that are permitted pursuant to rules of professional conduct, you know, but the judge just flat out asked me, yeah, can you give me more reasons as to why you need to withdraw? So I was like, well, you know, a client gave me like bounce checks and didn't pay on time and didn't comply with the terms of the legal representation agreement. So yeah, so sometimes the judges will just kind of put you on the spot and I'm sure they totally understand because they were practicing attorneys before too. Yeah, <laughs> the necessary party is Mr. Green, <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah. So, um, so always remember to get paid up front because you're running a business. You're not running some sort of social services type of place. 
Yeah, so I have this other friend who is a solo attorney and he said that he's flat out told people who expect him to work for free. He's like, this isn't legal aid. You know, <laughs> I need to be paid for my services. This isn't legal aid <laughs> and then you get rid of them. Yeah. Yeah, Durham County, it's a failure to comply with rule number one, I know. <laughs> yeah, so, um, okay, so what are some other little aphorisms? Okay, well, not really aphorisms, but advice, of course, is you need to document everything and get it in writing. Yeah, because there have been sometimes, even as, as recently as this year, when I made it clear that this is the scope of the work that I'm going to do for this flat fee, and then the person turns around and tells me, oh, I thought you were also going to do this and that, you know, and I'm like, we didn't even say that. This is why I need you to sign the legal representation agreement. Yeah. So definitely, I mean, it's not required, but it should be a requirement. Um, I'm not sure what it's like in other states, but um, yeah, you should always get a legal representation agreement, get it in writing, make sure that it clearly sets out the scope of the representation. And mine also says that, you know, this agreement does not cover any work outside of that specified above in paragraph number one, you know, so you set the parameters and say like, look, this retainer is only for me to assist you like up to the point that a lawsuit might need to be filed, or if a lawsuit needs to be filed, then X, Y, Z, you know, we'll do another legal representation agreement, or you need to pay me a bigger retainer deposit. Yeah. So um, definitely don't let that slide, even if you think the person is sort of like your friend, or, you know, person seems nice and well educated. Well, it doesn't matter, you know, you need to get it in writing, make sure that the client signs it. Um, cause sometimes people will just pay you, but then they'll conveniently forget to sign the legal representation agreement, or some people will actually want to change the legal representation agreement. I'm like, this is what I write and you agree to it. You know, you don't get to argue back and forth about stuff. So, um, yeah, on that note, if you already see red flags with the person, you know, just kind of dicking around with the terms of the representation or your price or trying to talk you down, you know, then maybe you don't even want that person to be a client anyway, because the person is already showing signs of being like a problem client. Um, I've also heard um, from one of those other, you know, how to start a solo law practice um, books. It says that you might want to cut out one client every month because what do they say? Like, 5% of your clients will cause 95% of all your problems or, or cause you the most stress. Yeah. So, so this one attorney's advice was that every month you should look through your whole list of all your clients or cases and get rid of at least one of them. And to me, that seems kind of mean, mean and excessive. Like I, I have never been that tough on getting rid of clients, but say like every every few months, you know, if there is somebody that is a total pain to deal with that I really dread getting emails and phone calls from, then in that case, you know, I probably would would say, you know, get rid of the person, have some sort of canned speech to let them know, you know, probably tell them over the phone as opposed to email just to say that, oh, I don't think I'm the right attorney for you or, you know, my caseload has gotten so much that I need to, you know, I need to tailor down my legal practice and cut out some clients, you know, find some way to let them down easy, you know, to say it's me, not you, when it really is them, you know, being like a total pain in the butt to deal with. Yeah. So, oh, thank you so much. Yeah, 15 years. I can't believe I've, I've been running a law practice for that long and I'm still in business. Yeah. <laughs> so what are the good signs of a good firm? Just want to know your opinion. Yeah, you can always see the good, but things that a young lawyer should. Um, I think the main good sign that you want to look for is that there is not any turnover. Yeah, because where I've practiced, like in this whole triangle area, after a while, a lot of young attorneys know which are the lousier firms, the firms where they're always hiring. They are always like in lawyers. It used to be in lawyers weekly. You know, you would always see the same firms that were constantly hiring for associates with at least two years of experience, like a revolving door. That's a bad sign, you know, because that usually means that people are either getting fired all the time or people can't stand it. You know, because I did hear, uh, yeah, uh, like I, I would hear about certain solo attorneys or different, different firms where, um, 
you know, people would just complain all the time about what a horrible place it was to work, or they had a friend that had worked there and couldn't stand the partners. So, um, so if there's a lot of turnover and you always see them hiring, then that's a bad sign. Also, I think like if they pay too low, that's usually a bad sign too, because it's like, then why, why do they need to hire an associate if they can't even afford to pay $50,000 starting salary plus benefits? You know, that's just kind of insulting if they expect to get an attorney, you know, to work for whatever, you know, $20 an hour with no benefits, you know, and I'm not making that up either. That was what, that was the offer that one of my relatives got when she was trying to look for a job. Um, so, uh, yeah, there was a firm that offered her $20 an hour and 30 hours a week with no benefits. <laughs> so she decided to stick with document review. Yeah. So, um, and then of course, you know, you want to just look for respect, respected partners, you know, people who have, um, practiced for say like at least like say at least 10, 10 or more years, 10 to 20 years or more. Um, because you want to find mentors, you know, it's always good to work for a firm, especially when you're a young attorney where you can, feel kind of protected knowing that you're not going to commit malpractice because you're working under a respected, much older and experienced attorney who will also give you advice. So, I mean, that's an ideal situation that everybody looks for, right? Like you want to feel like it's sort of like a family, although you shouldn't really treat your coworkers like family, but, you know, ideally it would be great um, for law firms to provide good mentorship to their younger associates and not just treat them as expendable people that they can get rid of every couple of years. Um, but, you know, not every firm is like that, you know, to a lot of law firms, the employees are expendable. Yeah. So, yeah, right. <laughs> Well, thanks a lot. Yeah, I remember when I was in college, there was this Vietnamese guy that lived in my dorm who said, I don't think you're going to be a good attorney. You're too emotional. Yeah. Well, that guy, um, he actually ended up going to Hastings Law School, and he's practicing somewhere in Southern Cal now. But um, yeah, I mean, there have been times. I remember I got this like hateful letter from a former client because, um, yeah, I had gotten kind of upset at her and her brother during a mediation after finding out that they were kind of dishonest about something. So that client got really mad and wrote this like three or four page handwritten letter to the partners at my firm, you know, just basically ragging on me and telling them that, that I was, I was just like terrible. And like, I had pretended I was her friend first, but then, you know, didn't help her and wasn't on her side during the mediation. And, and she knew that I was not going to have a good career and not going to be a good attorney anyway, you know, I'm just like, okay, well, you know, look at yourself, you know, can you even look at what you did wrong yourself? You know, perhaps what I told you about your case no longer being good because you guys lied to me, you know, that was the honest truth. So anyway, there's, there have always been like some people here and there who were very rude to me. And sometimes I felt like, you know, they wouldn't be treating me that way if I were some like big, tall, white man. So, um, you know, whatever, you know, I can't really change the way it look or, you know, can't grow any taller or whatever. So I'm just grateful to those clients that I've had, the vast majority of whom have been very nice and professional, um, you know, paid me on time, paid my bills, you know, were respectful of my time and were willing to take their chances with the, you know, Asian female attorney. So although, of course, there are some people who definitely, you know, they're just still looking for some big, angry white guy, or some people even say they want like a angry, angry Jewish attorney or something. You know, I couldn't believe it when I first heard somebody said they, they want to hire like a angry, mean Jewish attorney. I was like, really? I didn't know Jewish attorneys had that, had that stereotype. Yeah. So um, anyway, I'm trying to just get through my notes since I know this is dragging on a really long time. Um, okay. So keep the overhead low, document everything, stay on top of your billing. Um, oh, and here's another saying that you should always remember is like, why buy the cow if you can milk it for free? Yeah. So once again, you know, when you're self-employed, there's always going to be people who just reach out to you when they want something or they need something because they need 
free legal advice or they just ran into somebody's car. What do I do? Oh no, you know, my kid just got arrested. What do I do? You know, oh no, you know, DSS is calling my relative. What do we do? You know, so um, that's where once again, you do want to still kind of retain that relationship depending on, you know, what kind of relationship you have with the person. But after say like 15 minutes or so, that's kind of where you, at least for me, you know, I'm learning that I do need to draw the line somewhere because otherwise those types of people will continue to email you and dump on you with their legal problems all the while while not paying you for your time. Um, my former employer used to um, tell people, this is how I make a living. Yeah. And then just kind of give the spiel as to what her legal fees were for doing the work or giving the consultation or whatever. So that's kind of stuck with me that, um, you know, if you have to tell somebody, hey, you need to pay me, you know, a good thing to say is, um, this is how I make my living, you know, as in, how do you expect me <laughs> to, you know, pay my bills and um, pay my cost of living if I give away my work for free? So, um, yeah, you definitely want to be able to draw those boundaries so that um, people respect your time and they won't just keep coming back to you over and over again and tell all their friends like, oh, yeah, Judy will talk to you for free. Yeah, just give Judy a call and, and run that by her or here, just um, email that document to Judy and she'll review it for you. Yeah. So and it also helps that I do have like an online payment system. Um, you know, there are plenty of ways to pay people electronically now. So it's not like they even have to come physically to my office and give me a check or cash, you know, so it's like, okay, here's the link where you can make the payment, you know, I'd be glad to review that document for you. <laughs> yeah. So, um, okay. Yeah. So um, I guess that, that's our, my main um, bits of advice for people who are interested in starting their own solo practices. And I really attribute the success of my practice to, you know, all the really great people, um, especially all the attorneys that I've met through networking groups and um, people who trusted in me enough to send referrals my way. Um, I was also very active um, for a while in um, just like different voluntary bar associations, just go to as many things as you can, like continuing legal ed classes are also a great way to do networking because you never know who you're just going to sit next to and, you know, hand out your business card to. I also met people just randomly at the courthouse when we were doing divorces or defending um defending people in child support enforcement court, you know, you get paired up with another attorney and then you just sit there and start talking like, Hey, you know, where'd you go to law school and um, where do you work? What do you do? You know, let's meet for lunch sometime. So of course it was a lot easier before COVID, but even now I'm really excited because I'm finally meeting another attorney friend. Um, actually, We've never met in person, but we know each other through Facebook and just talking on the phone. So we're finally meeting in person on Saturday. We're going to eat outside at a Mexican restaurant. So, um, yeah, so definitely want to do your networking with as many people as you can in your legal community. Yeah. So um, I agree non-traditional law firms will be big soon. I'm really happy. Yeah, definitely. I think that's what people really want. You know, this whole... Thing about working nonstop and billable out, you know, over 2000 billable hours a year and people having to be stuck working in the office past nine or 10 o'clock every day and on weekends. I mean, that's just really, unsus what do you call it? Like unsustainable. I don't know how people can stand it unless they really don't care about spending time with their families or having any other hobbies, you know, other than working all the time uh, inside the building. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I really hope that more employers in general, you know, will let people work from home and have flexible schedules. You know, this is a time where there are more men that are getting involved with raising their kids too. So it's all good, you know, if they have flexibility for everybody, you know, just, for example, just having like I don't know, like a month of maternity leave or three months maternity, paternity leave, that just doesn't seem like enough. Um, to me. So, I mean, how are people really supposed to live their lives and have a fulfilling life if, if they're just like working all the time at the law firm? Yeah. Enjoy the guac. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Well, I do like guacamole. Yeah. COVID broke the legal practice big time. I'm sick of this traditional world. Huh? Few aliens, politicians need to change soon. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's at least it showed us that it can be possible to to do as much work from home and remotely as much as you can. Yeah, because I really like just doing these like consultations with clients through Zoom now. It used to be that I'd always have to schedule a time and then physically, you know, meet them in the office and sit around waiting. And sometimes people would miss their appointments or be late and I'd still be sitting around, you know, just I just really hate being trapped at the office. So that's why I don't I don't think I would work for another employer or a law firm again, or I don't really need to. So um, yeah, I just hate that feeling of being trapped and being stuck in the office and can't move or can't just roam around or do whatever errands I need to do or, you know, go skating if I feel like skating in the middle of the day and stuff. Yeah. So um, Zoom has really been great. I'm, I'm going to be continuing to pay them for their services. Yeah. So, um, but in terms of YouTube, though, I don't know how many people out there are really here to hear about my one, yay, one year anniversary on YouTube. But I did want to also touch a little bit on that, too. Um, instead of only focusing on how I grew my solo law practice for the last 15 years. But um, yeah, one year on YouTube has been a very interesting and overall very fun experience. It's just a big hobby of mine. Um, I got noticed today that Google AdSense is going to be making a deposit into my checking account finally. So, um, so that's nice. But it, it's turned out so far that I'm probably only making about $80 a month from YouTube. And the YouTube gurus say that if you really want to make more money, you need to get sponsorships or whatever, get a Patreon account, do affiliate marketing. You need to, you know, get paid by companies to hawk their products on your YouTube channel. And I don't know, I, I just still feel like that's probably not really compatible with my channel and my niche or my whatever my market if I even have a market yeah I mean it'd be one thing if I were like some 20 year old with a lifestyle travel or eating type of YouTube channel but doing some legal types of videos and stuff I'm not really sure I don't really see a company coming out to sponsor me especially since some of my videos are kind of critical of the legal profession <laughs> so um, yeah but but the cool thing is that I have gotten a couple of little freebies here and there so um, the first freebie that I got I guess I should help help out this small business owner it's this Taiwanese American woman from California who makes really beautiful jewelry. So you've probably already seen me wearing my boba tea and my like Taiwanese street food steamed dumpling earrings in some of my YouTube videos. And I didn't do that because she paid me. It was because I really liked her earrings and stuff. So I had bought her bubble tea earrings. And then I told her about how I wore them in my video. So she was really happy and just out of the blue sent me the free earrings. So I was like, yeah, that's really nice of her. Um, so that's her website, MissModi.com. So she has really beautiful, you know, enamel type jewelry, earrings, bracelets. And they're usually in these like cute little kind of like Taiwanese themes. So if you like bubble tea and you want some bubble tea earrings, then go to MsModi.com. Um, and then another cool thing that I got, which I put in the last vlog, was this free sit-stand desk that's electric. It's adjustable. And it was thanks to my friend Eunice at home, Eunice Choi. Um, she's in a couple of those like YouTuber support groups with me. So Eunice was approached by Apex Desk and they wanted her, I think, to make a video showcasing their adjustable sit stand desk. Um, so that's Eunice's YouTube channel, which has like a ton more subscribers than I do. I think she has over 4,000 subscribers now. It's mostly like home decor, shop with me, you know, home makeover type stuff that you might see on HGTV. Um, yeah, but um, Eunice didn't want or didn't need that kind of desk in that color that they wanted to give her. So I was like, me, me, you know, I would like a free sit stand desk and I'm willing to, you know, make a video about it. So, so Apex Desk, you know, they did, you know, approve of me and they sent over this really awesome desk. It didn't even take that long to put it together. So I've really been using it a lot at home. So I'm really happy with that. So that was another perk of being on YouTube is getting this like free adjustable desk that otherwise would have cost, um, I think the retail price of it is like 420. Yeah, more than $420, I think. 
yeah so anyway just be nice you know that's their website but ultimately like they didn't really want me to incorporate it into a vlog not like a lot of people watch my vlogs anyway so they finally the the guy was like oh yeah you know on the other hand we'd be happy if you just made like a less than one minute video showcasing you know how the product works and you know using it or whatever and I'm like okay well i'm not a professional videographer i don't have any professional equipment i'm still using my cell phone to record myself but okay and it, it actually took a lot more time than i expected just to make a i don't know like a 48 second little quasi commercial for them um just having to record everything like opening up the box looking at the instructions all the pieces of the thing putting it together and you know pushing the buttons and different angles of the table and stuff yeah but anyway those are the perks of doing youtube so far is that i got a pair of free earrings and i got a free sit stand desk and i'm making about 80 dollars a month so overall that turns out to be me making about like less than 50 cents an hour <laughs> <laughs> you know, for the amount of time that I spent, you know, putting together the videos and editing them and, you know, live streams usually don't take as much time because I just, you know, do a tiny bit of preparation and then wing it, um, which is great. So thank you guys for watching and everything. But um, yeah, I mean, doing YouTube really is not profitable at all, you know, for the vast majority of people. I mean, who knows what the secret is? There are some people out there that are making YouTube into their career where they quit their full-time job and they have, you know, 100,000 plus or, you know, millions of views on their videos. I'm like, wow, well, isn't that great? But that's not happening for me. So I guess I'll keep my day job. So, yeah. Oh, I'm a third year student. Work at a firm at a, as a law clerk. Have you ever felt? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even, even sometimes now I feel like a fraud. <laughs> yeah. But I've been out of law school for like 21 years. How do you overcome this? I don't feel confident yet. Hmm. Well, I think all you can do is really just become really good at whatever area of law that you intend to practice and get a lot of mentorship, um, hopefully work for people that know what they're doing so that you can learn from them. And it has been hard because when I was a solo, I remember reaching out to some older attorneys and even just asking them for some advice or asking if they wanted to meet for lunch and they just totally ignored me. So I'm like, okay, you know, it's like a lot of people don't want to help others. And sometimes I still feel like this too, because I have been approached by some younger attorneys and some of them just seem to really want to milk me for all that I could offer them. But I'm like, why? You know, like, I don't have time. I don't have time to do work for somebody that doesn't know what they're doing, especially if they're not my employee, you know. But um, yeah, I mean, all you can really do is try to be really good at um, what you're going to practice. And then um, especially like at some of my jobs where I did work for really great attorneys, um, I did feel more confident because I felt like, you know, I was working together with them on some cases and that I had the adequate supervision. So I felt a lot more confident in what I was saying. So um, it just comes with experience. And also you just have to practice too. Like, you know, it, it, even in YouTube land, like you guys can see some of my videos and I don't sound very confident and I was speaking too slowly and it was just really boring and everything. But just think like if you ever had to go to court or, you know, who knows, maybe someday you would do some sort of oral argument. But um, that's very rare usually, you know, doing an oral argument like in a court of appeals or something. But if you had to go to court or even if you had to meet with a client one on one or to do a deposition, you just need to practice or do dress rehearsals all the time. You know, like sometimes you can just talk to yourself or practice in front of your roommate or practice in front of, you know, your significant other or your other coworkers so that you start feeling more and more confident. So, so that's why doing YouTube is also really good practice. So um, I'm not sure if you really wanna sink time into doing a YouTube channel when you're in law school, cause I think it is kind of a distraction for most law students, but doing YouTube 
is really good for everybody in general because it forces you to practice public speaking and to be a little bit more articulate and more confident in front of other people, even if it's just a camera or a live stream. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I mean, just the more you practice and the more experience you get, the better you will feel working as an attorney and not feel like a fraud at all. I mean, but everybody starts out that way. I remember definitely being very nervous a bunch of times when I had to go to court or had to take a deposition and the other attorney was a lot more experienced than me, you know, very rude. So it, it can definitely be tough. Yeah. Um, oh, lawyers in suits look like aliens. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, we all joke about how some attorneys are like wearing business wear on top, but then we're wearing like ratty shorts or leggings underneath our, our dress clothes in front of the Zoom. Yeah. Oh, okay. You do have advice. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So my other um, YouTube advice. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Um, my other YouTube advice is that um, you always want to create value for people who are watching your YouTube channel. So instead of making it just all about you and your great day and your fun day out to the beach or your fun vacation or whatever, you want to show the viewers stuff that will be visually enticing or be educational. So that's where, you know, a lot of YouTubers will show food. And I like showing food too, because I think it kind of jazzes up um, my videos instead of just me as a talking head talking to the screen all the time. Instead, I want to show food because everybody likes to eat, right? So um, yeah, so make, make it visually appealing. Um, I would like to give some tips about um, StreamYard though. Um, I'm sorry, I kind of had to like wipe my nose and stuff too. I should have brought some tissue here. Uh, this is kind of embarrassing. I'm not prepared. Okay, so if you ever do a live stream, make sure you have some tissues nearby and you definitely need to have something to drink. Okay, and definitely don't drink bubble tea while you're doing a live stream because at my very first live stream, I had this like thing of bubble tea from Quickly and I thought it would be cool because people would like to see bubble tea but ultimately the tapioca balls were like kind of stuck in my throat and just kind of gunky and then you know you have the sugary liquid going down your throat too so i felt really awful during the live stream trying to talk while drinking the bubble tea and i had no water handy so so yeah so if you ever do a live stream just have plain old water or some kind of like watered down tea. Don't have anything dehydrating like coffee or or something like bubble tea that will get gunked up in your throat and make you feel really gross and, and hurt your ability to talk. Um, also, from what I've heard from Nick Neiman and in general, when you do a live stream, you want to already have topics that you're ready to talk about. Don't just throw up a live stream for the heck of trying to get watch time and then just kind of bumble about aimlessly, you know, hoping that people are going to ask you questions or people are going to show up and entertain you because that's not the way it works. Like you're supposed to entertain the people out there so that they will want to watch your live stream. So um, I did make this mistake in some of my live streams was that I was kind of bumbling about at the beginning, you know, like kind of readjusting the lights or playing music for too long or, you know, talking about something else when people want to get on the live stream and start hearing the advice or start hearing the information that you sold them on. So um, you should start out the live stream as if it's just going to be like a regular video that will be up on your YouTube channel and immediately dive in and start out, you know, by showing them the food, the product, you know, in Jared's case, you know, start showing the doll, start showing the makeup, start giving the advice instead of, you know, bumbling around and talking about how tired you are. Or, oh, I'm sorry, I was late. Or yeah, I've just been really busy. And, you know, I'm so sorry, I'm stressed out today, blah, blah, you know. So, um, so yeah, you always want to give value to your viewers. And um, from what I've read, people have very short attention spans, especially the younger generation, because they're so used to you know, looking on Instagram and TikTok all the time where everything is just like quick, you know, like short attention span, encouraging type of videos and stuff. So um, that's why when I edit my videos now, I try to make the video clips a little shorter so that it's, that it's not just one continuous stream of, oh, here I am sitting at my desk giving some advice that's legally related. You know, it's so boring that you really want to spice it up visually with 
either, you know, graphics or with uh, what they call B-roll or footage from other videos that you can get for free from different like um, stock video or stock video, um, what do you call it, stock photographs that you can get from different websites. So um, definitely want to spice up your videos that way, have a nice clean background, don't have some messy, dirty looking stuff in the background. So um, like in one of the YouTube support groups that I'm on, I did tell somebody recently, I mean, he didn't seem offended or anything. I did tell him, look, you know, that was a good video, but we could see your dirty dishes in your kitchen sink and we could see all the stuff in your living room. I think he had like a kid. So he had like kids toys or some like kid furniture that you could see kind of messy looking in the background of the cooking video. So um, yeah, I mean, every every little thing counts, you know? I mean, one weird thing about being on YouTube also, I don't know if it's really weird, but <laughs> but usually I don't wear this much makeup. You know, like before YouTube, most of the time I would just go for days without putting on any makeup. And if I had to go to court or whatever, you know, maybe I'd stick on some, put on a little bit of lipstick or whatever. But since I'm doing YouTube all the time and editing all these videos, which takes forever, I keep looking at myself. I'm like, oh, I look so old in this shot. Or, oh, you know, my face looks fat in this view. Or, oh, I need to put on foundation. Why didn't I put on foundation that day? You know, I should have put on more eyeliner. So um, so in the past year, I've definitely, <laughs> I guess, gotten a little bit more vain and had to like go out and buy these like fake eyelashes and buy better lipstick and, you know, put on foundation and buy more eye makeup and stuff. So um, on that note, I do want to give a shout out to my friend, Allie Cat Castle, who has a makeup um, YouTube channel. And she also needs more hours to get monetized, but she has plenty of subscribers now. It's just the watch hours that she needs. So if you're out there and you like makeup, um, Allie Cat Castle is a professional makeup artist who works in DC and has worked at major um, department stores, um, you know, like for Dior, I think, at Saks Fifth Avenue. So um, this is my uh, YouTube friend who has also taught me a lot in the past year about how to do makeup. So, so when you're on YouTube, you definitely want to try to spruce yourself up a little bit, you know, yeah, I mean, anything to try to get people to stay on your channel. So if there's a way that you can kind of highlight your looks a little better by slapping on some lipstick or eyeliner, um, dress a little nicer, make sure your background is not a big mess, you know, that's what you got to do. Um, okay. Uh, is it true that a tr trust account requires a minimum deposit? No, no, no. I mean, I, I guess any bank can have their own requirement, but the bank that I use is, um, well, it used to be called SunTrust, but now it's called Truist, Truist Bank in North Carolina. Yeah, there's no minimum deposit for, for my trust account. Yeah, but I guess I guess some banks do have these kinds of rules, probably because they don't want to administratively deal with all the mess. Because if it's a trust account, then I mean, here in North Carolina, they call it IOLTA. Um, and then the bank also has to give interest on the funds. And then the interest every month ends up being given to fund things like legal aid of North Carolina. Yeah, so there's a lot of administrative mess for the banks if um, if you create a trust account. Yeah, so you should try different banks because at least my bank doesn't have a $15,000 minimum. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to have a trust account either because um, I don't always ask for such a huge retainer deposit from my clients. Yeah. So, um, okay, well, if anyone has any further questions, feel free to ask them, but otherwise we've lasted, oh my gosh, we've lasted over two hours and I can't believe it. But um, thank you guys so much for joining in in today's live stream, being so supportive of my YouTube channel. And um, it's just been a really fun adventure, um, a really great learning experience. And I hope to continue on doing YouTube. Um, and I really appreciate everybody sticking here until the end. Um, on Sunday, I'm going to do another live stream because I remembered, hey, it's Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. So my channel is called Asian American Legal Focus. How could I not do anything special for APA Heritage Month? So I contacted another YouTube YouTuber friend of mine. Her name is Angel Trazo, and she is actually a graduate student at UC Davis in California. And here's her YouTube channel. Her YouTube channel 
covers a lot of different subjects, but um, lately she's been doing a lot of fashion hauls, like um, showing off brand name clothes that she finds through thrifting. But um, she does have a really um, very popular video about how she self-published a children's book. It was about accomplishments of Asian American women. So it's a really nice book. I ended up buying two copies myself. So Angel is going to be my special guest on Sunday's APA Heritage Month celebration live stream. So it's going to be at 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time, 5 o'clock Pacific Standard Time this Sunday. And she's going to talk to us about um, being a grad student at UC Davis, teaching Asian American studies, and how she self-published her book. So I think a lot of people are interested in those types of issues. So hope you guys will join in then. Yeah, thank you for being here. Have a good night. Can't believe it's so late now. <laughs> Take care then.